So this is Senate Government Operations. It is uh, Friday, January 29th, and um, <clears throat> we have a couple items on the agenda today. And I will, um, because uh, the couple people that are with us today are not used to being in our committee, so I will just um, remind them, um, not that they would be tempted to do it, but we don't use, we don't use chat. On, in our committee because um, I consider that a sidebar conversation and if we were in the room in person, we wouldn't allow it to go on. So the only thing we use chat for is if you have some kind of a document or a link that you wanna um, give to Gail, she'll put it on there and then she'll make sure it gets on our document list um, later. So with that, um, I don't know uh, Commissioner and Elizabeth, if you know everybody that's here, but I think we'll introduce ourselves because there might, I, we have at least one new member. So I'm Jeanette White from Wyndham County. I'm Anthony Polina from Washington County. Brian Collimore from Rutland County. <clears throat> Allison Clarkson, Windsor County District. Keisha Rom from Chittenden County. And since we're not using chat, I just wanted to write, remind my chair and others that I'll be gone for about 15 minutes at 1.15 to report a bill to Senate Education and I apologize. Yep. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Those other committees are a drag, but <laughs> we lost Senator Polina yesterday for a little while. We, so we, <clears throat> so um, we have, we don't actually have this bill, S42. It is in health and welfare, but last year, because it's the creation of a new commission and we kind of oversee the, the organization of government. So uh, some, we often weigh in on boards and commissions. And um, we weighed in on this one last year and supported it wholeheartedly. But we just wanted to make sure that we had the same information this year and that we're, uh, so that we can let health and welfare know that they might have five um, people on their side. So with that, um, I think what we'll do is instead of uh, walking through the bill first, Katie, I think we'll have Beth um, go first because I know that she has an appointment she has to leave for, um, one of those little vaccine in the arm for a relative of hers. So um, we'll start with you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. First, I have to say it is really nice to see you and actually be connecting with you. I've been watching your committee, but uh, to connect with you this way is really meaningful. Um, it's been a hard year and uh, I look forward to the opportunity to come back to the state house and see you each in person. So thanks for this. Um, I'd like to start with just a, a little bit of a, of a story just to lay, you know, set the table here. Um, <clears throat> this fall in September, my, my son uh, came downstairs and said, Mom, uh, I, I'd like to join the Jericho Underhill Fire Department. Uh, I, I find that COVID is an isolating experience and I want to connect with my community and this is the way I want to give back. And I paused for just a second, or I must have, I'm not even sure I was aware of my reaction, but he caught it. And he said, are you worried that I'm gonna be hurt, that I'll be injured? And I said, I took a, a, a breath because I had to for, for, uh, for, for my own peace of mind. And I said, no, I'm actually, uh, I know what you're gonna say. I served six years as a prosecutor. I did the sexual assaults, the serious crimes of violence, homicides, domestic violence. I went to the crime scenes uh, and the awful and timely. So I knew what he was gonna say and it broke my heart. Uh, and I told him that he had uh, our permission but that we had to have an agreement that when he would come home <clears throat> from one of those awful uh, experiences um, that first we needed to talk about it and also that he needed to avail himself of the support if there was any at his local fire department and if there wasn't 
he needed to let us know so that we could figure out a way to find him that support. That is not a unique story. Two days ago, I was talking with retired uh, UVM ch uh, chief of police, Gary Margolis. And I shared that story with Gary and Gary laughed. And he said, you know, I had the exact same conversation with my son when he told me he wanted to be a firefighter. And I told him that he had my blessing, but for two pieces of agreement. And those were the exact same uh, concerns that Gary shared. Uh, because Gary, uh, like Jim Baker, and like anybody who's been associated uh, with th this world knows that what you see and what you experience is traumatic. And if you don't address that trauma, uh, the injuries are lifelong. And if we want to look at it from a government perspective, they impact not only the employers they serve, their coworkers, but the public that they interact with. So uh, with that in mind, thank you for taking up this bill. Thank you for your support last year. And thank you so much for uh, really making an effort to move this along. As you know, it passed out of the Senate with great support. It, it, and it sort of fell apart in the house because I think we were in the middle of COVID and everybody's capacity uh, was greatly diminished. I'm hoping that if we can get to the house sooner rather than later, we have a, sh a real chance at, at passage this year. Uh, Jim's on and he will share with you uh, uh, what, what got him interested. It's a, it's a very moving story. He reached out to me uh, and shared this idea he had and uh, of course, I was all in. I remain committed to seeing this through passage and adoption. Um, Jim and I worked together at Public Safety for many years, so it didn't take much explaining. The, um, uh, the reason for this bill is obvious to the first responder world. We are in House uh, Senate, Senate <laughs> Health and Welfare, and I would say that the bill uh, We'll have one technical change. We need to obviously change how we refer to the Vermont Criminal uh, uh, Justice Council. In the bill, it's the Criminal Justice Training Council because that's how it uh, was referred to last year. And obviously that's changed. So we need one technical correction. Uh, and there, uh, there will be a request to make two additional changes. I don't know what the committee's response will be to language that we sent over this morning. Katie has it, um, but we're suggesting that in uh, subsection B4, in the committee's charge, you'll see the number of things the commission, excuse me, the commission's charge. The commission is charged with among other things in B4 to educate the public emergency service providers. And we're proposing that we add language and their immediate families. Uh, at the end of that paragraph, we want to ensure that in addition to examining pre prevention and intervention and the effects of trauma experienced by emer emergency service providers and law enforcement officers that we include and the effect that trauma may have on an emergency service provider's immediate family. <clears throat> in addition, we're going to propose a new section which will require a little renumbering in subsection B and that section speaks specifically to some of the additional barriers that uh, women, uh, members of the BIPOC community, members of the LGBTQ community, to include those who are non-gendered, might experience in um, raising their hand to say, hey, I need help. So we've included language that says, consider best practices that encourage emergency service providers to overcome perceived stigmas they may associate with addressing or reporting trauma related emotional injuries to include emergency service providers who may identify as black, indigenous, persons of color, LGBTQ, female or non-gendered. Um, those are changes we're going to request. Uh, well, that's the language we're, we're suggesting that they include um, in the Senate Committee uh, Human Services. So that's where we're at. Uh, I don't know how they'll respond. I'm hoping this week will take upcoming, next week will take testimony, I believe, uh, former Rutland Mayor Chris Loris, 
will be testifying. Uh, I did speak with Chris. He's going to tell a very personal uh, and uh, pretty moving story uh, in support of this bill. Uh, and then uh, I don't know if there'll be any other witnesses, but I expect we'll take this language up. So that's, uh, that's the status. Uh, do you all have any questions for me? Does anybody have any questions? I have talked to Senator Lyons about the, the language. Um, so I'm glad you brought it up here because um, we will act. I mean, it's part of, it will be part of the bill, I believe. So great. Thank you. Any, Al, Senator Clarkson, you are muted. How fabulous. I'm so well disciplined by my chair. I should be muted when I'm not talking. Anyway, Beth, it's great to see you too. Good to see you, Jim and Katie, but I have, Beth, it's great to see you back at you. I'm just curious why you limited it to the emergency services, service providers, because as we know, trauma is experienced in, in the medical profession, in state's attorneys, in, 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 uh, a number of areas sort of around this. I'm just curious why a wellness commission would just be limited to one sector when the, it trauma is experienced in a number of professional ways and, and volunteer ways. But. Well, so we're, we're really addressing a, a system, a particular system and the healthcare system is its own system. And I, uh, I, it is not to the exclusion of their trauma. And I, uh, I suspect that this work actually might inform others as to how to move forward. It's, I'll let Jim speak to how he came to identify this, to work within this particular system, what you might call, um, you know, the first responder world. And, and you know, we certainly recognize, I'll be the first to tell you that um, when I was a public safety, I was a, a general counsel, I was asked to help put together their peer support team, which was, which was their way of trying to support their membership. And uh, as part of my work with them, I attended a conference. It, uh, it, it included an expert that public safety had brought in. And as I was sitting and listening to this expert describe PTSD and trauma, related uh, injuries, I recognized for the first time my own trauma-related injury uh, as a result of my time at the state's attorney's office and what I had borne witness to. And um, the light bulb went off. I didn't have any association between what I'd experienced and uh, what word we were attaching to it until that moment. So there is you know, there's no end probably to the lines we could draw. I think Jim can speak to this, but my guess is he tried to wanted to start with a world where we where we've made some progress. Let's get it right here. I suspect that gradually we will be get, be adding and applying uh, what is learned here um, potentially to to other folks working in this area. Jim, I, I don't know if you want to jump in and and add to this. I would, yeah, I would, we'll just jump to you for that okay. and Thank for you. whatever else you have to say. And Beth, if we don't, if you have to leave before, um, please uh, thank you for coming and, um, and for sharing your story. Thank you, Senator. And again, thank you for uh, the support again this year. And, and I got a comment on, on Senator Clark, not on the piece about expanding it, but I'll get to that in a minute, Senator. <laughs> I do think this is probably the first time I've actually seen my good friend Beth Novotny in I think over a year and a half physically seen her. Uh, may, maybe a year. Maybe we saw each other at the state house quickly, but uh, that's uh, Beth and I have a lot of history together. And the reason why I'm bringing that up is when I came up with this idea, and I'll walk you through how I got to where I am um, on this idea, the first person I called was Beth because I knew she had one of the best strategic minds of anybody I've ever been around. And I needed some help on an idea that was floating around in my head <clears throat> and how could we do something about it? Uh, that's how Beth, and Beth has given up uh, countless hours, countless hours over the last year 
um, talking with myself and other members of the first responder community about um, championing this process, this legislation. So um, again, for the record, my name is Jim Baker. I'm currently the interim commissioner of corrections, but prior, prior, I, uh, th this bill uh, idea came forward prior to becoming the commissioner. And as you all know, I work for the governor now uh, with Secretary Smith between me and the governor. And I tell you that because the governor does support this legislation and has given me permission to speak in my role as the commissioner of corrections um, to support the legislation. And, and, I, and let me just tell me, I, I, especially for newer members that may have not heard this last year, um, you know, in 2018, I had, I had the unbelievable honor of receiving the Con Hogan Award. It's an annual award given in Con Hogan's name. Um, it's given to someone that um, uh, has had public service and uh, uh, around the area of, of making a difference through data. And uh, I, I was recognized primarily for my work that I had done when I was the chief of police at Rutland. And, uh, I was nominated for that award by uh, someone who I have an enormous amount of respect for. Um, and, uh, and, and I was given the award. And along with that award came, came a pretty hefty um, stipend. And I guess I skipped over who nominated me, but it was, <clears throat> it was Mary Powell when Mary was the CEO of Green Mountain Power. And, and uh, I consider Mary a friend and a, and a mentor. Um, and I was given this fairly significant um, stipend. And um, some folks on the committee know that I had some medical challenges around that time. And uh, I was uh, in the battle of my life and uh, I, I was blessed to have those resources to, to pay off and support some of my, my medical expenses. But I, um, I set aside a certain amount of money because I felt like I was honored in the name of a guy who I had no business being mentioned in the same sentence as Con Hogan. And I needed to find something that I needed to give back. Um, and I was looking forward to to something I could pay forward. And um, as, I, as I was recovering from some surgeries, um, I gave it a lot of thought and I landed on um, something that I've been passionate about for a long time. And it was around the suicide of police officers. Um, many of you know that in my career, I also worked for three years in Washington, DC for the International Association of Chiefs of Police. And one of the things that was in my portfolio when I was there was the overseeing and development of the Center for Officer Safety and Wellness. And um, I, I became very much involved in the conversation nationally about the suicides of police officers. And just to put this into perspective, what, what, a, what a challenge this still is nationally. Some of you may or may not have seen this, but since the uh, uprising uh, at the Capitol on January 6th, two police officers have killed themselves that were part of that that were in that fight for their life on the ground at our US Capitol. One was a Capitol police officer and another one was a Washington DC Metro police officer. And uh, you know, suicide's a complicated thing. And so I had a, I had a big interest in that. And um, as, I, as I was recovering, I gave it some thought and thought I could expand it. As I did research on suicide of firefighters and paramedics, I realized their numbers were out of proportion as well. And uh, I had a pretty good understanding of trauma. Um, as Beth said, you can't be in the business that I was in and not think back about um, situations where I was traumatized. I remember the first double fatal car accident that I ever investigated in October of 1978. And if you ask me to describe that scene right now, I can describe to you in great detail, uh, including where the bodies were inside the car um, upon impact. And that's the kind of scene it was. And uh, I've been very blessed in my career um, to be married to someone that uh, was a registered nurse and uh, Senator Clark, I'm gonna get to this in a minute because it ties in and that um, um, understood what trauma was for a very long time and uh, supported me over the years. And I've been able to work through it. So I came up with this idea that I wanted to work with first responders in the state around providing support to all first responders who are exposed to trauma. 
And I started making a bunch of phone calls and doing some investigative work. And uh, again, I had quite a bit of free time on my hands because I was doing some consulting, but not working full time. And uh, I learned that um, the, the services provided to all first responders in Vermont were uneven. Um, you could be a firefighter in Burlington and they have a pretty robust program where they support their firefighters. Senator White down in your area, the Brattleboro Fire Department has a pretty robust program supporting their firefighters. But if you're a firefighter in a small town in the Northeast Kingdom, especially if you're not associated with a locality, that you're a nonprofit fire department, you don't get the same access to care or support that a firefighter and a paid fire department gets. And um, I know in the law enforcement community, it's the same. Um, there's not the programs that look like what the Vermont State Police have. And um, Corrections, when I got here, had started a peer support program a couple years ago. And I, I will tell you another factor that drove me uh, to do this was the suicide of a corrections officer who I was very close to in Rutland when I was the police chief. And after I left, um, this individual committed suicide. And the day he committed suicide, I got a call from the Rutland City officers telling me that he took his life. And uh, I, I love this guy. And uh, he, he was somebody that had a big impact on the success that we had in Rutland. But he had a very complicated life and uh, a lot of trauma in his life. And he just couldn't work his way through it. And by the way, his complication in his life showed up in work performance on the job. And he had been become the subject of an investigation inside corrections that led him to make the decision that he couldn't go on. And um, those are the things that drove me to put this together. So in June of 2019, uh, we pulled together a, a group of all first responders at the fire academy. And, and this is when I reached out for Beth. And we floated this idea about, could we put a working group together and put together a conference for all first responders, which we did on June 9th of 2019. We had 250 plus people there. If I had to find, and that's what I put some of my resources towards to underwrite that conference. If, if, if we had more money, and I, I had some very generous supporters, including um, Mary Powell that helped us put that on. If I, if I had more money and resources, we could have put 500 people in that room. It was, uh, I think Beth was there. I think she will tell you it was a powerful, powerful experience. The governor opened up the conference. This is before I, I guess I was auditioning for the governor at the time. I didn't know it because a month later, my phone rang offering me the corrections job. But the, the governor was there. And I will tell you, and I'll, t I'll tell the story at the end. The governor said to me, um, I, I can do the keynote, but I need to leave because I have other commitments. Our keynote speaker was a trooper talk about it in a few minutes. His, his presentation was so powerful, the governor couldn't leave. The governor would not leave. And uh, I think his security staff kept motioning to him it was time to go and he didn't go. He stayed until the end. And so this is how we got to where we were. And coming out of that conference, what we did in the afternoon of the conference is, is what I would call a town hall, where we just opened it up for conversations we had, I don't remember the questions now, but we had three or four probing questions that we facilitated a town hall conversation. But here's what's important for all you to understand is that coming out of that fire EMS and police corrections was there uh, unbeknown to me that I would be the commissioner. We invited corrections to come into, into the conversation across the board. We heard the same thing. There are not enough qualified clinicians to deal with this type of trauma. Um, insurance companies will not cover it. Um, Workman's comp is an issue, especially if you're a nonprofit EMS or fire and you can't get EAP support. And um, we heard stories about volunteers that committed suicide. That yes, they're your local plumber, they committed suicide, but is that tied back to their service as an EMT for 20 years where they've seen countless tragedies at scenes or suicides, whatever the case may be. And um, Coming out of that, one of the things that we decided was that we were gonna to try to put together legislation and move forward. And that's how we got to where we are now. So Senator Clark, I, I say all that to come back to your point. The idea in the beginning was to focus on one system. Now, ironically, I think we can all agree that um, 
the country's traumatized right now. I mean, I, I, I don't care where you are on the spectrum and it doesn't matter, but we are living in a very, very treacherous time. And then you lay COVID-19 on top of that. And these first responders are, um, you know, I have 18 employees quarantined right now in, in, in the correctional facility in Burlington with three positive um, incarcerated women. And um, this is what folks are facing every day. It's just not the everyday stuff that I faced when I was a road trooper or when I was, uh, when I was the police chief in Rutland or any of my other experiences in life. Um, now we have this COVID-19 thing that's putting enormous stress on people. I can tell you inside my agency right now, my staff is very stressed. And to the point where I worry every day, um, I, I don't want something to happen on my watch. As a leader of a department, I've lived through losing troopers. I've witnessed suicide. I, I've been involved in um, funerals of, of troopers that have killed themselves. And um, this is a very challenging time. And, I, and ironically, the bill cleared the Senate last year because of many of your support, and I appreciate that. But this is an entirely different year this year. And I'll wrap it up by telling the story, and then uh, I'll certainly move on to questions. But um, our keynote speaker, and, I, and I, I use his name, and Senator White, he's a constituent of yours down in Wyndham County. And uh, I, I, he has, uh, and if you so felt the need, he would love to come in and testify. But his name is Kurt Wacky. And on December, or excuse me, on April 8th of 2008, I happened to be the Colonel of the State Police at the time. And uh, I was with my family on vacation in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina when my phone rang. And uh, I was briefed on an incident where a mom in a psychiatric crisis um, threw her two young children into a roaring brook and leaped into the brook herself. And Senator, if you remember this, it happened in Wardsboro. Mm -hmm. and, um, the state police, uh, as Kurt told the story that day at the conference and as the governor sat there, and I know he was just, uh, couldn't move as Kurt told the story. Kurt talks about getting the call at seven o'clock in the morning. He was playing with a small child before he signed on as a trooper at eight o'clock. And the dispatcher, he could tell from the tone of her voice that something bad had happened. And he immediately responded to the area with other, ironically, fire and EMS and other troopers and other folks trying to make a rescue of these children. And he will tell you the story as he watched the child bob down the stream. And he tried to get into the water to get to the child. And a firefighter grabbed him and the other troopers, saved their lives. He talks about um, not being able to do what he thought his job was because the, to answer the question about why the first responder community there's a stigma in the community that when you're called, there is no failure. And when you fail, it's a big deal. It's a big deal psychologically, and it's a big deal emotionally, and it's a big deal because you didn't get the job done that you're paid to do. And Kurt talked about this at the conference, and uh, I've maintained a relationship with Kurt for the, for the, the uh, it's hard to believe I'm saying this, for 13 years since that incident. And I talked to him quite often. And um, he went back to the command post that was set up at the Woodsboro <clears throat> Fire Department, soaked from head to toe, and walked in. And he still talks about the fact that people were, like, in his mind, ignoring him. And I'm sure it was because what are you supposed to say? Hey, you didn't do what you're supposed to do? But he, he, he took that as failure. And in, in the business of peer support and best practices, the best way to, that should have been handled there peer supporter should have took him off to the side and, and, side and done what's called a diffusion and diffuse the situation. But from that day forward, he tried to champion on for the next four or five years as a trooper. And every month that went by, it got worse for him to the point where he had to finally go out. And by the way, the other trooper that was with him, one of the last things that happened as a colonel of the state police a year later was we had to fight for him to get a disability retirement because he fell apart immediately and uh, had a lot of other issues in his life. And um, I, I've always carried this story forward because it's um, that and the loss of the corrections officer to a suicide um, and other traumatic events in my life. I always thought that if I had the opportunity to do something about this, I would. And so this is why this bill is in front of you. And, um, you know, uh, Kurt, 
Kurt went out and because of the good clinical support the state police had, he was able to go out on the disability under the new law that, that post-traumatic stress syndrome is in fact a disability and he's doing fine today and he's with his family and he's been able to work through it. And um, I think that's what I wanna see for all first responders in the state. And that's why we put together this effort and uh, I share that story with you. So with that, Senator, I'll, uh, I'll be quiet now and uh, I'll certainly answer any questions that folks have. Thank you so much. And I, I am going to, um, uh, and I know Senator Clarkson, I know that there are, there's trauma in other areas too, but I'm going to limit the conversation to this, to first responders here, because um, in the interest of time and in the interest of supporting this, this particular bill, I, I want to acknowledge that there is trauma in lots of other places, but this one is specifically addressing first responders. And I will, I'm just going to say one thing and then I'll ask if anybody has any questions and then we'll have Katie do a, I think a high level walkthrough because I, the details of it are going to be in health and welfare, unless, and committee members may not even need to have a walkthrough. So we'll, we'll see where we are. But I, I will say that, um, as you probably all know, um, the, uh, my, our previous sheriff in Wyndham County had, um, had a, a near experience with suicide and he's been very open about it, but, and he did get professional help, but perhaps had there been something like this in play earlier than that, he might have, he might have not gotten as close to suicide as he did. Um, but, and that was just, his, his um, help came only because he happened to be on the right road the, at the very moment that he was um, considering suicide. So with that, um, does the, do the committee members have any questions for the commissioner or um, questions about the bill itself or whether we want to have a walkthrough of it or leave the, the details in the walkthrough of, um, with health and welfare. So committee, Senator Collimore. Thank you, Madam Chair. No, I don't have any questions. I want to thank uh, Commissioner Baker and uh, I guess uh, Ms. Novotny has left us, but um, yeah. for being with us today, um, Jim and I have known each other quite a while and uh, some of that I'd never heard before. So it was uh, extremely interesting. I don't need a walkthrough. I'm fully in support of this bill, including the changes that Elizabeth um, referenced uh, to include the families of these folks as well and the addition of the uh, BIPOC reference. So I'm fine. I'm fine with the way it is. And I, again, I thank, I thank Jim. You're welcome, thank you. Sir. I'm welcome, uh, Senator, you're welcome, Senator. <clears throat> Senator Polina, I see you've unmuted yourself. Yeah, no, that was very powerful testimony. Um, I'm I'm good with the bill as it is, well, with the changes that have been that have been that have been uh, put forward as well. So I don't feel the need to go through the bill. Appreciate Katie being here in case we need in case we needed her, but I, I don't really think it's necessary. I, I mean, I I've re I read the bill and I understand the bill and I understand from the testimony how important it is. So I'm I'm good with the way it is, with the changes that have been offered. Thank, Thank you, Senator, Senator Clarkson. Oh, I agree. I mean, I'm the mother of a state's attorney, so I, uh, I, I hear the trauma. Uh, I hear it all the time, and uh, and and you know, he's not a first responder, although he is a firefighter. He's a Woodstock firefighter. Uh, I, I think the, I mean, this is critically important. I, 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 the stigma around getting help is huge, uh, particularly in this community, but the stigma exists everywhere about getting help on this. Um, I'd love if, if, Jim, if you'd be willing or Katie or whoever, it would be great to just have some of the statistics in the last five years of, of sadly, some of the consequences of not getting help because I, we're, our I, job I, I is to advocate and paint the picture. And so it would be great for us to just be clear on in each of these areas, you know, what, what the impact has been without help. I, I will get that to you. And, and Senator, to your point earlier, and I don't want to take much more of the committee's time, but 
it's interesting because I have a friend who works in this space in Vermont who is now starting to work with the nursing community uh, in, in the emergency rooms because of COVID and the stress that's on the healthcare. And so what I'm hoping comes out of this is the research and the work that we do can be applied to other disciplines and other systems in order to support people. Because again, um, we, are, we are operating in very challenging times. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Commissioner. I, I think that, and thank you, Katie, for being with us. I believe that um, we're all set that we don't need a walkthrough because um, you, uh, Beth pointed out the changes that are that being proposed, and I think everybody is okay with the bill as it is. So what I will do is um, send a note to Health and Welfare that we as a committee support the bill and the proposed changes, and that, um, and then they will, they'll have five more people on the floor absolutely in support of the bill. So if that is okay with everybody. Yes. Okay. Good. Better yes, thank you. Thank Senator you for Clarkson. Time. So, Sorry. Uh, Jim Baker, I'd just like to say it's good to see you still in this position. <laughs> <laughs> Ask his wife about that. Well, I know. No, I know how I, she feels. I know. <laughs> but I have to say, it's it's wonderful to still have you leading corrections, and thank you for your continued service. I, Senator, thank you, and I appreciate the support on this bill and everything that you support corrections on and uh, I, I deeply appreciate it. And just going back to the Senator's comment, the fact that we've been isolated for a year and I work out of my former consulting office, which is a mile from my house, makes a big difference than being in Waterbury every day. So my, my wife is being very patient. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. And thank you, Katie. Thank you, folks. Thank you, Katie. Thanks. Bye Thanks. now. Take care. Bye. So um, the next thing on our agenda was the EMS system and there was some confusion. I hope Pat, that you weren't confused. There was some confusion about whether it was related to S42 or not. It was not related to S42 at all. It is, we are, um, I had a conversation with um, Commissioner Gustafson a little while ago and um, we, one of the areas of, of within our jurisdiction is the emergency management system. And we have been working on um, help, trying to help uh, make this system more sustainable for the past few years. And we've made a number of changes, just a lot of them administrative or regulatory or how often they have to be certified and who has to certify them and uh, the education and the training and, and making sure that that they have alternative methods to, to um, licensing or certification other than um, on-site ones. And we've been working with um, the Department of Health and with um, uh, Patrick Malone, who is the, um, he's in charge of uh, rural health options, I think it's called at the University of Vermont. So he does the um, EMS system. So we've, we've made a lot of changes. And then when, um, before COVID, and then when COVID hit, we made a number of suggestions and recommendations around their training and um, scholarships, uh, stipends for them to uh, get trained. It still is not a sustainable system. And so what we're doing now is looking at, we're trying to, continue the conversation and go in different directions. And one of the, I'll, I'll tell you why the two of you are here. Um, the, we have heard that um, the um, cost of becoming a paramedic at VTC is close to 30,000, but the cost of the same paramedic program at Greenfield Community College, which clearly is closer to us than Randolph, is about 7,500. So we don't, we aren't sure if those are comparable programs or, or why the cost difference, if it's the state underfunding of our state system. What, 
but so we need to have a better understanding about that and then um, and what alternatives there might be and how um, the the academy is working with the um, with other other um, places for training like the uh, career centers perhaps and then um, Commissioner Gustafson you are here because we want to continue the conversation about how do we how do we reimburse them? and we're not talking about reimbursement levels or how much they should be reimbursed but how do we reimburse and what do we reimburse them for is it with an our control or is it something that's set someplace else how much control do we have how much um, leeway do we have around treating them more as um, health care providers than um, and and we've been working toward changing the culture from thinking of um, ambulance services EMS system as a transportation service to more of a health health care service that they are really an extension of the hospitals and the doctors that they work for or with so those those are the conversations that we want to have we don't necessarily expect any um, answers from you today or any I mean, if you had answers, we'd be very happy to, to receive them, but um, we, we want to continue this conversation. So this is more kind of a conversation than um, kind of a testimony, as if that makes sense. Um, so do either of you have a time constraint? And if so, um, I would be happy to put you first. Are you, and you're both muted, just for your information. I, I only start talking when someone says you're muted because I think that's that is prereq for every Zoom meeting. Someone has to be, you're on mute. Um, I do I, not have any time constraints. Yeah, so. I, I, I mean, I, I have a two o'clock, but. Um, Why don't we start with you then? Of time. Well, I, I, so thank you for the phone call ahead of the testimony. Uh, Senator White, I appreciate that. I appreciate you recounting that again. That's what you had told me. So um, in light of that uh, angle of approach to the conversation, I asked for Sue Ellen Botigi, our, um, she's the director of our um, oh. provider member services team. And uh, so, she, you know, really, I guess the starting point for the conversation is what are the parameters under which um, these, the types of providers are reimbursed because I don't think the culture aspect of it is an issue from our perspective in terms of yeah. in terms of what we pay, how we pay, or, or what we do. I mean, I I, um, I know there are parameters. If you want to get into the details, I'll have Sue Ellen um, uh, sort of talk to you about those if you have specific questions. But I I will also say that um, what I told you on the phone is still true. That um, you know, we have been in this process of professionalizing our reimbursement uh, and payment methodologies at the Department of Vermont Health Access, and it's not limited to EMS. It's across the board. Um, I'm not sure that EMS has gotten that um, review yet. I mean, it's a, there are thousands upon thousands of codes and um, mm -hmm. services uh, that we uh, need to be um, professionalizing, and we've made a lot of progress. Um, but we, I mean, I'd say we basically are looking for a benchmarking, we're looking for a methodology that's repeatable and usable, and then that we're looking for regular review and intervals to be able to make sure that it isn't, doesn't require um, a legislative conversation when it comes that a, a code has been left or, or a reimbursement has been left behind for, for a long period of time. So mm -hmm. um, just on like the actual rates, um, you know, that is something that we're really going across a lot of areas. I don't know if EMS is in that space, but I, I, Sue Ellen and I have had conversations about some of the, this isn't a new conversation either, not to say that it's old, 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 but it is something we have talked about. Um, and there are some, I would say federal limitations on what we can and can't pay for um, that creates, um, I, I would say difficulties. And I mean, from a lay person to, an, to other lay people in this area, I don't think uh, Medicaid can pay for um, a trip if there's not a patient. So then that makes, you know, and, but they still made the trip, right? And 
thoughts. And uh, I believe, and you know what, I'll just stop and ask Sue Ellen to, to jump in and because I, I'm going to go on the like, you know, three or four that I think I can remember. Do you, Sue Ellen, do you want to color this a little bit so that they have a sense? Because I think what we need to do, by the way, is to get to this, uh, an end point of this conversation or a resolution or a get, make progress. Uh, we need to know the specific problems uh, so we can come up with solutions. I mean, we are actively <laughs> engaged in um, payment reform, which is different than just uh, having a professionalized fee schedule that gets regularly reviewed. Payment reform is purchasing healthcare in a different format so that you have a different revol result. So it could, we do now look to prospectively pay for healthcare. Um, that creates a situation where the providers don't have to chase the dollars. Um, they actually just have to make sure they're there when they're needed, and that changes the dynamic of, of what they, how they end up performing healthcare. EMS, I, you know, we'll have to look at it, but we also have had success in this area, and so it's not, I'm not just talking about the all-payer model or the ACO environment. I'm, we have several other payment reform um, efforts uh, Applied behavioral analysis is one that we've been engaged in for a while. We're buying, we've, we've constructed the reimbursement in a different format. And in order to, to get what we, what to solve the problem, I'll leave, I won't go into the whole story, but uh, we've had success in a few places. Now within the agency, we have all kinds of um, uh, department uh, representatives coming to us saying, can you help us with payment reform in this area and in this area? So the DIVA payment reform team has been very successful at, um, creating, like I said, a methodology for solving what is the what is the problem we're trying to solve, getting at it, um, and producing a methodology that can better serve. Uh, you know, in in the end, we're looking to serve three parties. We're looking to serve the patients, so the patients are better solved served, so that the providers are 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 able to be sustainable and and preserve access to care. And then, lastly, the taxpayer. Right? We don't. The, the easiest thing to do is to just say, how much more do you think it would, would take? And then we just appropriate that money. That's not the goal. We, we owe it to the taxpayer to make sure that um, every dollar is, is spent as, as well as possible because every dollar that's spent in, one, spent in one area is dollar that's not spent in another area. So balancing that is, is also part of our, our, our task and our responsibility. So um, if you want, I can ask Sue Ellen to talk about some of the parameters that she has heard that, to be a problem. I don't know that we've had direct communication from the um, emergency medical service representatives in this current year regarding reimbursement. So I don't know if she's heard anything of, recent, of late, but we've had a lot on our plate um, and as part of the healthcare system in the last year. So um, maybe I'll pause there and see how you want to proceed. Yeah, no, that's fine. And I, I don't know that, um, I don't think we have any um, interest in setting reimbursement rates or anything like that. We're not, um, I think what we need to do is understand what the parameters are. Like you said, Medicaid can't pay if there's a trip with no patient. So does that mean we need to redefine what a patient is when we're looking at our EMS system as health care providers as opposed to transporters. And, and I don't know, and I mean, that's not your question. That's- We can't, so. pay, right, right. Well, we can't pay a doctor if there's no patient either. Right, like, right, but in this- In a fee-for-service model, that's what I'm getting at. And so right. I think that, I mean, that, that you're, start, you're beginning the conversation of solutioning but let's uh, let's figure out what we need to do and where the where the pain points are for the providers. Right, also. right. No, I, I I get that. I was just thinking because we we talked before with EMS about um, how are they are they transporters or are they healthcare providers? So I, I mean I think that's a that's a larger conversation too, and they all fit together, and we need to have the conversations, but. Yeah, I, I think that it would be important for us, Suellen, to understand what kind of what the parameters are that we're we're dealing with, and and um, without coming to any conclusions now about what to do about them, but just what they are. But and I did see that Senator Clarkson had a question. Corey, it's good to see you. I actually right. thought of you the other day when they were talking about hockey issues, and I thought, oh, Corey, I haven't seen Corey in a long time. I haven't seen anyone um, in a long time. Now, 
Um, I didn't know he was a commissioner <laughs> until just now. So, wow. Well, uh, <laughs> for uh, following Mark Larson. Um, mm -hmm. So, Corey, uh, in, uh, on this transport issue, I mean, it, it, it's uh, it's to me a, a, just a classic example. I mean, they are transporting themselves and they are actually caring for a patient. And because it may be a successful outcome that they don't have to transport someone to a hospital because they may have intervened in such a productive way that there is no transport, but they transported themselves to deal with the patient. <laughs> and yeah, it's just, it's a, it's a, it's a system that really does need review. So we encourage, yeah, we'd love to have the EMS crowd on the radar screen for payment reform because um, they may be in fact saving us dollars and they need to be paid for, you know, rewarded for and paid for that. But I think we need to understand what the parameters are so that yes. we understand what, what we need to change in the EMS system and in the healthcare system to, to abide by those parameters. Because if they're set up for us, we, we can't change those. We can only change the way we, if, if we can. So we, I- But why can't Medicaid be changed? We, uh, let's find, let's first of all, find out what the parameters are that we're dealing with and then start thinking about, because Medicaid, they, they have certain parameters that they have to work within and we need to know what those are. Is that fair? Uh, I think it's fair, but I don't think it's the final. It isn't uh, yeah. the final, but we're just, we're just starting the discussion here. I don't want us to come to conclusions with 10 minutes into the discussion. Right. Okay. So Sue Ellen, do you have um, thoughts for uh, some uh, <laughs> words of wisdom or uh, around what, what are we dealing with here in terms of how constrained you are and therefore how constrained we are? And welcome, by the way. Is she here? Oh. Yes, yeah, she is here, but she's on mute and off camera. Are you there with us, Sue Ellen? I did yeah. see her earlier and I see her name. Yeah, she, her, and she was just telling me, uh, clarifying my comment too. So she, I don't know if she's- There, there she is. Thank you guys. I could not unmute myself. <laughs> okay. First of all, Sue, and cl clarify the non-transport issue because it's not it, it, it's a little different than I think they understood. But go ahead, clarify that. But then also anything no, else related to our the restrictions that the Fed relationship in a Medicaid program puts on us as far as right. flexibility. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly, I'll be happy to clarify some things for you. So the way Medicaid works right now is we enroll the ambulance providers. So the actual ambulance, if you think of it that way, we enroll them, they, they bill us and we pay for their, the ambulance company's services. So if an ambulance goes uh, because there's a fall and they don't end up transporting to the hospital, we would still pay that ambulance company for that trip. We, we, we've always done that. We will continue to do that. I think what we're trying to understand here, or what I'm trying to understand here is, are we talking about individual emergency responders billing Vermont Medicaid for their services? I think that's one of my questions that will lead to further discussion on understanding our parameters and can we even do that? Um, I'm not sure I understand, but when we were, the people that we've been talking to are like Rescue Inc. out of Brattleboro, which is an ambulance service entity, an emergency provider. And um, the Rutland, uh, well, the Jim Finger is the chair of the um, Ambulance Service Providers Association. What, he's out of Rutland, but he's the chair of that. Yep. And our understanding really was that if, if they didn't transport to the hospital, they didn't get paid for that. We have uh, actually numbers. We've actually ran the uh, ran that information the other day, and in the last fiscal year, we paid out thirty nine thousand dollars to the ambulance providers. 
so I'm wondering if maybe it's more of an education to the ambulance association telling them that they have this ability to do it. Well, <laughs> I mean, that's something that, that those are the kinds of things we need to, we need to know so that we can work with the, the service, the system to, to help them there. So that's, that's very good to know. So, okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Yep. Um, and I'm happy to give any of that background information, you know, run numbers or anything like that, because I think it's important that we have all the facts in front of us when we're making those, you know, having those discussions. Well, and I do know that I had talked with the commissioner at one point about a particular provider in my area who was, who has a very high level of, um, Medicaid patients, and um, he, he was going out of business. And one of the problems was his um, he his inexperience um, in billing, and that that's such a complicated thing. Oh, and and so that, he that you wasn't an with, yeah, right. That's a that was an actual no. He wasn't a yeah. healthcare provider, correct? He was an actual. But I'm just saying yeah. that sometimes the the knowledge about how to bill and stuff is is um, really important for people. And in this case, the commissioner worked with the person to to help him. And um, maybe the same is true with the ambulance services. Well, I was just using it. It was Sue Ellen that helped him, so. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Sue, Sue Ellen. Uh, she Collins. knows all about it. <laughs> OK, all right, <laughs> thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. That, that's my job. And actually what I enjoy doing is helping providers uh, succeed. So it's important to me. Good. Thank you. Senator Collimore, did you have a question? I did, Madam Chair. Thank you. And it is great to see Corey and Sue Ellen and Pat. Um, you just gave a figure, Sue Ellen. I just want to make sure I'm understanding. Are you saying that you paid out $29,000 for a whole year's worth of ambulance services? No, what we paid, and it was thirty-nine thousand. Yep, thirty-nine thousand and sixty-three dollars to be exact, of uh, services that did not result in a transport. So ah. the ambulance services billed us when there wasn't a transport, a person within the ambulance that they took somewhere. So that just for those services. Okay, and that's an annual figure, correct? Statewide. Correct. Yep. From 7 2019 to 6 30 2020. Yep. Okay. Statewide of what was billed to us. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Senator Clarkson. Okay. Sorry, Sue Ellen, can I just clarify that? I thought you said you paid 39000 for one year of transport that didn't result in a transport to the hospital. That's exactly it. Yep. So it's I, not sorry, every year. It's not the same amount every year. No. 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 Yeah, the 39000 was from 7-1-2019 through 6-30-2022. Or 20, sorry. I, might, well, I was going to say, ooh. 20. Yeah. <laughs> great. Uh, okay, great. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't mean it was a repeating annual figure. I just wanted to make sure that that was a, an annual figure. Yes, thank you. It, I understood as well. Thank you. Yes, I did too. The annual figure would be different every annual, but it's right. still an annual Correct. figure. Yes. Senator Polina, I see you. Yeah, I have a pretty basic question, I think. Are ambulance providers considered healthcare providers? Do they fall into the category of healthcare providers? We consider them transportation providers, and that that's a bigger conversation, yeah. I know. Right. Yep, we consider them transportation providers, so we pay them with transportation codes with that they bill us. So, yes, we, at this point, that's how it works. Right. Yeah. So the reason why I ask is, you know, as we move away from fee-for-service, we move towards capitated, capitated payments. Those are for healthcare providers, and I just wonder if down the road that someday there will be an opportunity to... I don't know what the word would be, but to bring ambulance services in as providers so they could be paid for on a capitated payment system as well. So obviously, that's just something, you know, it's a brainstorm kind of thing. I'm not saying that's going to happen anytime soon, but 
It would be one way of dealing with it's them. Something we can definitely look at. Correct. Yep. Something that we can definitely consider as we, you know, look through healthcare reform. And I'm sure Corey's putting that on his list as we're talking. Yeah, I saw him write it down right away. <laughs> Are you I think we already talked about it. I think that's you know it's what we're talking about is purchasing yeah. healthcare services differently, not even, not just healthcare, just purchasing right. services in a way to get right. what we need. And what we I need is to make sure. I mean, whether they're healthcare providers or not, I that's a we can have that conversation or that. You know, I have to look at what the parameters of tr transport versus healthcare. I mean, I think emotionally we all sit here and go, of course. Their healthcare providers they they arrive on a scene and do something but that doesn't exactly. the definition of it is different than what our what our our emotional brains say to us about whether or not they're healthcare providers so i don't want to get ahead of that conversation but in terms of payment yes we, we purchase all kinds of services most of them in the medical uh environment but we do purchase services and we are um you know very as i said off the top we're very much interested in um, getting, understanding that how you pay impacts what you get. And, and what we really want is access to uh, EMS services across the state in, in, in a way that makes sure that, oh, well, specifically from my chair, that Medicaid beneficiaries are, um, are able to get to medical facilities in a, in a, when they need to. It just seems that folding them in as healthcare providers so they can be part of a capitated payment system would be an idea worth looking at, as, as Sue Ellen said. We, we will we'll keep this conversation going. I, this is not something that I think we will, um, in terms of legislative time, um, do anything that would result in any kind of passage this year. I don't sure believe because this is a longer conversation and I think we need to we need to really understand what we're doing and um, EMS and DIVA and appropriations and the Department of Health. I, I think it's a very complicated conversation. So That's Senator right. Clarkson. So to tag on to Anthony's question, which is so good because that goes to the heart of it. Um, are they able to bill under a different code when once they've arrived at a scene? Are they able to bill? Uh, is there a code for service for a healthcare service once they're at the scene? Are they able to bill under a, in a different capacity? I mean, is there a code for them? <laughs> is there a code for them currently that they are billing for their? emergency medical, the M is for medical, <laughs> medical service. This is Sue Ellen, I can answer that for you. Currently, no, and I, I do understand the question. So when they are doing the a CPR on a patient, are they billing for that? Yeah, that's Currently, not a transportation no. service. Exactly, so yeah, at this point, no, the ambulance providers do not bill us currently for that. So, and it, it so wouldn't be no under codes. the ambulance provider. <laughs> Right. So there's no codes. codes. We don't have any that. codes. There are codes for cool. that, but they're not. Uh, the ambulance providers are not authorized. Codes. How's right. That? There. The, if, if, and this is part of the conversation we need to have, and it isn't just a black and white question. It's um, if if a paramedic provides a service in an ambulance at a location that doesn't um, result in a transport then, or even if it does, are, are they able to, um, how do we uh, get it so that they can re be reimbursed for that service and the supplies that they use to, do, to provide that service, um, as opposed to the paramedic in an emergency room who can, bill for that service and and i don't know if it's because we're moving from fee for service to this um capitated system that that we need to go down that hole too far but but that's those are some of the questions that i think we need to that we need to address is how how um how we define the services that are provided by, and I think that's less a question for 
diva maybe than for the Department of Health, but I may be wrong. So I don't know if that muddies the water or not. But it is a complicated conversation. What were you going to say, Commissioner? I'm sorry. Uh, no, I, I mean, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I, uh, I think that w what we probably don't want to do is have us wait for a legislative um, mandate to engage. Mm -hmm. I think that we have, and I think that we've talked about it. I think some of the other comments about um, uh, EMS providers being re re reimbursed for medical services provided um, on the scene I guess we can look at that and what the limitations are there. I, I don't know that necessarily that solves the sustainability issue that it feels like is underlying all of this, right? The, the, the sustainability of these providers. When you and I talked earlier, that was, you know, the, the I think the word you used was they're in dire straits. So uh, wanting to understand that more was a, was a, a big concern. Um, but as we know, I mean, we have other providers in the state of Vermont, not in this space, but we have other providers in the state of Vermont that, um, you know, have said we need this, and and we've and it's been through a legislative conversation, say that we've said, okay, well, this is what we'll do for you, but it hasn't necessarily solved the issue, and that we're right back again. So, like, really understanding the problem, and I'll just go back to where I began. Are we understanding the problem. I don't have. Um, I don't think there's unless there's like a there are. And we should just get into our assessment of what the rules are about transport versus, you know, healthcare provider. Um, but I don't know that being able to bill for medical services by EMS providers necessarily is a solution um, that we might hope it is in this conversation. It, it comes with administrative burden. There are volunteer um, there are volunteer uh, responders um, that not part of the, the ambulance services mm -hmm. that, that go on scene. And, uh, you know, a couple of them have said to us, if I had to enroll, to get, to be paid by Medicaid, you have to enroll in Medicaid. And if, if enrolling mm -hmm. in Medicaid and doing billing was part of the deal, um, first responders have said, um, no, thank you. We, well, I wouldn't do it that way. I, there, it, and they used expl expletives too. So uh, like that, that is, it does come with you, right? You, so I, I, I don't know. I think these are all parts of conversations that need to be had, probably not in, the, in, a, um, in a hearing setting necessarily, but there needs to be some conversations back and forth. Maybe, uh, uh, you know, a, a study committee, I'm, I'm not probably the first commissioner to say, I think a study committee at the the first one to say it this year. I know it all happens at the end of the year, and they're trying to not have a bill passed. But I am saying it probably needs some investigation. If you feel you want to have something um, on the books with a, with a time frame to come back, that's that's usually the way to do it. But I think we, we will be we can are generally engaged in these conversations all the time. So um, having it on the radar scene, on the radar now, understanding the problem, it'll be good for us to. To delve into it, whether there's a bill or not that comes forward in the future. My my um, preference is that uh, it would be done without a bill. That it's it, that we don't we don't need necessarily a legislative fix. I think our role here is to get everybody in the conversation and to make sure that the conversation goes forward. And if the conversation is going forward and there look like there are potential solutions, then we don't need a bill. If it looks like um, nothing's happening, then maybe we need a bill to put some fire under the feet of whoever it is. So, and I think that you're right that the even if the um, paramedics were reimbursed for the service provided, the same as they might be in another setting. Um, that isn't uh, the solution. There, what we've found over the last couple of years that there are many little solutions and we've tried to tackle them all. Um, one of them is the workforce issue, for example. We get people all um, 
<clears throat> trained and in paramedic positions at rescue or wherever. And then they find out, wow, they could work at the emergency room at Brattleboro Hospital and make more money and not have to be on call all the time. So yeah. there's many, many issues around the sustainability of this system. And I don't, we're not, certainly not looking at the reimbursement as the solution. We're looking at it as one little part of working toward the sustainability. Yep, clarity around the problem we're trying to solve is will be a great uh, contributor to figuring out what to do. I right. I totally agree. And, and you, you are the reimbursement people. So we're talking to you about reimbursement. Mm -hmm. Um, Dan Basty and, um, well, not now, but um, uh, whoever is taking his place, if they ever get one, and Pat Malone are kind of the education people and Pat Moulton. So that we're talking to them about that part of it and the regulations that were in place by the Department of Health. We've made significant changes in those and that those made a difference. So we're just trying to tackle um, this piece by piece. And I know that there are people out there who are very um, uh, impatient and would like us to solve everything right away. But we heard from the um, emergency management people the other day that, that the changes that have been made have been very, um, positive in terms of helping them um, become more sustainable so okay Th thank so, you I, my two if i could oh, say my, my two o'clock is it's um it's eleven fifteen waiver stuff so it's not you know just a just a little thing oh, just you probably go, should get bye. to you probably should yes you probably should <laughs> Good to see everyone center colomar center ram everyone bye. center polina bye. clarkson white bye so I would say that we've kind of raised some questions and that we will um, have some more conversations with uh, probably Sue Allen and um, the EMS people kind of at the same time, we can have the conversation again. Does that make sense, Sue Allen? That makes perfect sense. Yep, I'm happy to engage however you need me to. Okay, thank you so much. I um, Thank you. And thank you for being here. And thank you for helping out my provider. Anytime. You know how to find me. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. So, um, President Moulton. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Hi, everybody. everybody. Happy New Year. <laughs> so, I'm, I'm going to, um, I just thought of this the other day because I got a call from somebody who's running um, as a UVM trustee who is not a legislator. And the very first person who was ever nominated as a non-legislator was Pat Moulton by me as I left my position because I was so upset that people think that it has to be a legislator. It's a publicly elected trustee, not a legislator. And so Pat was the very first person that was nominated and uh, for a couple very bizarre reasons, she lost by six votes. Yeah. That was anyway. a tight campaign, my first and only. So, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I've been thinking about you. Well, thank so you. So would you, do you want to just give us a little um, more background on this. Um, Keisha, I don't know if you, um, if we talked about this before, but there's, <coughs> we don't know if the programs are similar. You were here when we had the conversation with Drew, right? This wasn't last year, about the kind of the difference between the, the um, fees at VTC versus Greenfield Community College. Yeah. Or, okay, and, and what constitutes those fees and and why there's so much difference, and how we can how we can help um, VTC with this program, and and the relationship with career centers, if there is any, and the training center at 
uh, through Pat Malone. And so just a general conversation about, about that. So the one thing that, that might be helpful is um, I, I had been wanting to ask maybe like, does this help solve a problem in that we're low on EMTs in general yeah. or just that the training is onerous? Okay. Both. I mean, the, the, we're super low on. We, on. we, I think he gave us statistics last time, but we are, um, our EMS system is in dire straits um, financially, workforce, okay. um, uh, it probably in every every way. Okay, I didn't quite fit the gravity until now, so that's really helpful. Yeah, it's it's um, it's a system that is hanging on by its teeth, and a huge and huge retention, huge retention problem, yeah. and Train hanging them. on by your teeth. You know that in Vermont we do not do well with healthcare from the neck up. So if they're hanging on by their teeth, you know it's serious. Yeah. Okay, so Pat? First of all, good afternoon. It was great to see everybody. Happy New Year and, and congratulations to all of you for your election, um, Senator Rahm and re-election everyone. Uh, it's great to see you again and uh, someday maybe in person, right? My, um, Pardon my attire, it's Flannel Friday here at Vermont Tech. So uh, I got my Vermont Tech, my Vermont Tech flannel, oh. flannel company on. So uh, it's what we do. It looks like a nice um, blazer from what I can see. Oh, so well, then, then that's how I'll fake it. So good, thanks. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I'll dispense with the, you all, I think know pretty much about Vermont Tech and who and what we are, but um, our program is a paramedic program. It's not an EMT program. Mm -hmm. It's the next step up. Uh, it is a certificate program. It's approximately five years old. Um, we offer it currently in Bennington and Williston. Uh, it is a three semester long program plus uh, an internship. We get a 100% placement rate of our completers. Uh, we are a fully accredited program. And this year, thanks to the legislature and Corona Relief Funds, we were able to provide a substantial scholarship to Vermonters uh, to the tune of $18,000 a year, which I just wanna thank you very much for that. And that has doubled enrollment in our program. We have 27 students in the program this year. We had, well, close to doubled. We had uh, approximately 14, I believe, that com uh, completed last year. So it's had an impact for sure. Um, and why uh, is the, our program so much more expensive? Well, um, you nailed it, Senator White, uh, in large part because Vermont's 49th in the country for its public support of public higher education. Uh, as comparison, Greenfield Community College gets 59% of their revenue from the state. We get 17% of our revenue from the state. Uh, so that's a biggie right there. Uh, the other piece is it's a three semester program. Our program is 39 credits. Uh, Greenfield Community College is two semesters. Uh, it's 29 credits. I had a chance to compare the curricula between the two programs and our curricula really goes deeper into what I heard you talking about before, the sort of medical care provision. We go deeper into things like anatomy and physiology, airway management, um, EMS management, medical emergencies. There's similarities in the number of areas, but there's different. We do OBGYN and pediatrics, um, which I do not see in the Greenfield Community College. Um, uh, a few other classes that are not part of the Greenfield paramedic program. So um, that in a nutshell is the basic reason why in my humble opinion and from what I've been able to research um, you know, we, you, you brought up earlier, are we looking at alternative methods of delivery? I mean, suffice to say Vermont Tech is alternative, looking at alternative methods of delivery and new modalities for all our programs. Um, namely, how can we open it up to more adults? How can we decentralize delivery similar to what we have with our nursing program? Uh, how can we make it easier for students to access? And, uh, you know, the, the, one of the few bright sides of COVID is that uh, our faculty have learned that distance learning and technical education is possible. Uh, it's not ideal to have the same amount of time that, because students are not in the lab in the same way they've normally been. But um, our faculty have recognized that this is not you know, the end of the world to do this work. 
And in fact, our School of Engineering and Computing is going to be delivering all of its first year courses uh, synchronously and asynchronously to any adult that wants to enroll starting in the fall. So I think those kinds of opportunities can exist with paramedicine. You brought up linkages with uh, career and tech ed centers. That's clearly something I want to do. I would like to look at career and tech ed centers as possibly being labs for our instruction where we provide telemedicine or tel distance learning, telepresence for lecture, et cetera. So we make sure our property, properly credentialed faculty are delivering the class, but that we might have a lab tech at the uh, site of the CTE. Um, you know, right now we deliver in Williston and Bennington and we do some, something similar. There's, there's broadcasting of, of lecture uh, and then students are in Williston for the hands-on. So it's, it's a combined, it's sort of a hybrid in, in, in some cases. And we think we could do more of that. That does involve you know, expanding our expenses potentially in terms of lab tech, et cetera, but also potentially reducing in terms of not having to purchase additional equipment and things like that to do that kind of education. So I, I have not started that investigation as it relates to this program. Um, we've had general conversations, but the nitty gritty of getting into, okay, how do we make this work with CTE is still to be discussed. So that's roughly what I can uh, tell you at the moment, but I'm happy to answer any questions you may have too. Well, I, I just, I have one to start it off and then I'll call on the other committee members, but um, it's in terms of career centers, I wondered um, how, what the relationship was in terms of feeding, not using them necessarily as part of the program, but feeding from the career centers. And one of the things that I thought we heard was that um, whatever they did at the career centers was not transferable into the, it, it didn't, it, the VTC program didn't build on that. And I wondered if that was something that um, could be addressed. And then I know that there was a, two years ago, I think maybe we gave a, um, a grant to VTC as a pilot to work with um, some career centers around the state to try and figure out how to, um, expand some of the programs between the career centers and VTC and wondered if if this was one of those and if that was successful. Okay, I'll start with the first. I mean, the point of a CTE as a feeder is a definite possibility. I don't know right off the top of my head how many students we have coming in that come from career and tech ed. Uh, we, we often find issues with some of those credits transferring in and that has everything to do with our accreditation requirements and assuring certain content is taught at a college level. Uh, some of that potentially could be overcome through dual or concurrent enrollment. I mean, that, that can be analyzed. Um, so, but, but yeah, I mean, we have lots of CT sent, sent students that come here for all kinds of programs. I just can't speak to paramedicine specifically. Um, on the, yes, two years ago, we were, the legislature provided funding for us to investigate offering associate's degree at career and tech ed centers in part uh, driven by then Chancellor Spalding's uh, recommendation and Governor Scott's uh, excitement about that. We started digging into that. We sent an interim report as required into the legislature that identified a number of obstacles, a number of op opportunities. Um, we never heard anything back from anybody. Um, so had no idea how that was felt in the legislature. Um, we would have had to then expend another pot of money to to continue to investigate, it chose not to. I think we spent about $30,000 out of that whole 200,000. So somewhere there's 160, $170,000 sitting uh, that we have not touched in part because we felt that we needed to pivot and then COVID hit and the world as we know it um, changed. So uh, that, th that model assumed we might be using high school faculty might be using CTE faculty would the, the center would be the actual deliverer of the de degree program and that presents all kinds of concerns from an accreditation standpoint. The model I'm thinking of now is more it's our faculty teaching distance learning and the lab concept at the CTE to avoid those accreditation issues to avoid having to um, pay additional uh, salaries faculty salaries um, 
to enable students from anywhere to still access without having to you know, physically come here. Another opportunity that we're looking at is low residency options where we could again do the distance learning and students could come here to our labs for weekends, one week, whatever the case might be. Uh, and that, that is, you know, those are models that we're considering. In fact, right now we've got a whole group looking at that uh, modality, th those new modalities and those new opportunities for all our programs. Um, our paramedic faculty is, you know, uh, one of our key people is also a nursing faculty. So, um, you know, she doesn't have a lot of extra time to investigate these things. So, you know, we're trying to do this on our own and in collaboration. But um, so ultimately, Senator White, we, we sort of shelved that associate's degree at CTE idea because of the obstacles and felt some of those same opportunities could be met through a different delivery model. So um, I had a really brilliant question, but it went right out of my well, head. That money did assume we were going to start a couple pilots and we didn't <laughs> think we were quite ready to get to the pilot stage, that we had a lot more work we had to do. Um, then unfortunately, Lyle Jepson went and took a yeah. job somewhere else, yeah. dang him. Um, and so, you know, we've had a little bit of turnover plus COVID uh, and really said we need to pivot to a different way um, than, than looking than having our the high schools actually be delivering our, our content, if you will. Um, I, I just thought of my brilliant question. In developing your um, curriculum and your delivery systems, do you work very closely with Pat Malone? I no, not yet, because we haven't gotten there yet, really. I mean, there, we've been having individual converse, conversations around things like construction management and um, some of our manufacturing and even auto programs, but we haven't really said, okay, now let's get into the nitty gritty. And and I apologize, I there's so many Pat Malones in the world. He is, he's the director of uh, rural medicine oh, okay. at UVM. Yeah. And no, he's in not. charge of the okay. EMS system and he's, He's very um, oh, yes. uh, creative in terms of trying to come up with alternative ways to train people and, all, and, and even looking at some of the things that might be some of the education that right. Right. currently exists that may be better um, done in a different direction. Yeah. Some something. So he's he. We can, I, I would suggest working with him. Yeah, I will. I, I'll get my. I mean, our academic dean and the director of our program, Inga um, Smith Luce. Yes, Smith Luce um, is is the person who would be getting into those details. But yeah, if we don't have to reinvent the wheel, Amen and Hallelujah. So definitely, we'll be in touch with him. Yeah. Thank you for that. I, I and I know Inga has talked with him because I know I've heard her mention his name, but. Um, I have not directly. So. Senator Clarkson, did you have your hand up or are you scratching your head? You're muted. You are muted. That's our favorite phrase oh. of 2020 and 2021. I know. <laughs> I know. I'm trying to be good about it. And also, <laughs> Oliver started to print things. And when he prints things, it's right next to my ah. thing. Clap. <laughs> uh, Pat, hi. Um, I am. I despair at thinking that you submitted a report on workforce on um, and the CTE centers that we didn't address or didn't respond to. I'm sort of, and I I'm, I I apologize on our behalf. I don't know where it was sent, but I assume it was, was sent to education or to Senate Economic Development, and I am embarrassed that we did not address it. So I apologize. <laughs> Okay. Well, it was sent to the legislative, the statutory required recipient. So it was Agency of Education. Um, let's see, a whole slew of folks. But um, yeah. yeah, but we didn't hear a peep. Uh, uh, yeah, I, 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 <laughs> I'm, sorry, I'm sorry about that, just given how important this, these issues are. And so that's all I was going to say. And we will we will get on on that and other workforce issues ASAP. Well, it's it's you know it, it it was kind of a no harm no foul because and looking at this work and realizing geez, that path seems more bumpy than other paths that can achieve the same outcome. So well, but the pl the silver lining of COVID is exactly what you said, which is your faculty is happier doing remote learning teaching. Your, your students are now more used to, we're all now more used to it. And 
So remote instruction zoomed into CTE centers that can be labs is a great model and one that I think we should, you know, I think that's great. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's to, to your point, I, I think we've all gotten used to it. There are still students who do not do well um, and that is not a modality they would pick. Uh, but there are many who would. So and from a affordability and access standpoint, let's crank it up. Yeah. You know, and, and that's really the philosophy we in the system are following. We particularly here at Vermont Tech may not be great for our bottom line. Sure, we'd love that room and board. But if it means it captures more students and some of that 40% that don't even go on to any education past high school, bring it on. So um, that's what higher ed needs to be doing. And so it's, you know, and for us, as a technical college and applied hands-on, and particularly paramedicine, you can appreciate that you got to put needles in arms and you've got to, you know, do compressions and simulation is good to a point, but until you're actually out there practicing it, it's it's not great. And uh, that's what we do with our nursing programs. And you know, in the last year or last spring, everybody had to pivot, right? But this fall, we were able to get like our nursing students back into clinical, our paramedic back into clinical. Um, so that that helps a lot. So, but yeah, I think that's the I think that's the way we've got to go, and that's the emphasis that I'm going to be looking at as the whole system transforms, and we'll see where it takes us. So. Do you know, Pat, if the um, certificate that um, a paramedic receives from um, VTC is the same certificate that they receive from GCC, and would it qualify them for the same? positions? I believe it does. I had the GCC website up a minute ago. I'm, I'm looking at, I know it's accredited by the same entity. Um, I don't know. I mean, there are certain, like all the, well, it's a certificate. So you're, you're not really required to do gen, gen, general education <laughs> courses. Um, I'm got to, yeah, I've got to look, I have to look a little deeper to see if there were significant differences. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, there's no question we lose students to, to cheaper places to go. And as we heard a couple of years ago in this committee, um, it, and we've heard from all the EMS services, because we unfortunately had to end our fire science program, which was also where we taught EMT. Oh, and I should back up. We do a lot of EMT training now through our continuing education division. Not a lot. We do some. Um, it's in part a moneymaker for some fire departments. It's a pain for other fire departments. So we've tried to step into those places where uh, the fire departments really aren't equipped to set that up. And um, Maureen Hebert could give you chapter and verse on that if you would like. So EMT is, is pretty good, but it's getting the deeper into the paramedic piece. But let me find out about that license, that certification and uh, the similarities for you. I think Tasha had a question. Is, yeah, I just wanted to follow up on that one first. The reason I asked is because I wondered if the difference between the 10 credits, um, I know when we were doing the dental, ther dental therapist bill, there, we looked at the difference between the, the um, curriculum at VTC and the curriculum at University of Minnesota. And there were a lot, there were, things in the University of Minnesota curriculum that weren't necessarily geared to like um, office management. And I just wondered if there were things if in those 10 credits is that you could have two steps, a 29 credit one and then a, and then the full one. I, I don't know, I just thought yeah, of that. I mean, we'd, we'd, we'd have to look at that. I mean, yeah. we looked at whether or not we would expand to an associate's degree program and haven't chose to chosen to do that because that according to Inga that is the at the associates you can get into that higher level yeah uh, providing that more on in ambulance healthcare on site healthcare than necessarily we can do now and I'm probably misspeaking and 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 if you'd like to have Inga come back come and talk to you I'm happy to have her do that with you um so it's just, she's sometimes hard, but of course classes start Monday, so hard to get a hold of. But um, I'm just looking for, yeah, I, I, I'd i have to get back to Inga. No, it, yeah, it's not, it's just something to think about. Yeah. Senator yeah. Rahm, did you have? Well, I mean, I'm just offering this because it sounds like the situation is getting very close to dire and that 
that might increase the possibility that money could somehow come back to a program that um, is training EMTs who are highly needed. And so there's sort of like a possible revenue stream if they're trained for free, but go off to do work after that. Um, my, my good friend, Melvin Carter, um, was a city councilor in St. Paul. He's now the mayor. And when he was a city councilor, he created a really intensive uh, EMT program. And we're not supposed to share links, so I will do this later. Um, Pat, but the, the St. Paul Emergency Medical Services Program is an intensive tuition-free EMT certification program for low-income, underrepresented, and women residents of St. Paul between 18 and 24. They earn an hourly wage during training. It lasts 240 hours over 10 to 14 weeks. It's largely targeted for diverse, uh, linguistically diverse um, and culturally diverse students. And they've graduated over 200 young adults. It's a collaboration of their fire department, their youth job corps, their public schools, their um, community action partnership and the federal government. Uh -huh. And I, it's such a great program. I went and visited it. I looked at everything they were doing and they were facing a similar situation that was very dire um, and really just created a targeted intensive <coughs> program. So at some point, if there's too much of a cost to trying to keep EMTs, then you know, you would you we then we have to spend money to get enough EMTs into the pipeline, it sounds like. Yeah, I just I I just want to stress EMT is different. Different than paramedic, okay. very different. Um, okay. and the EMT is an easier, shorter term program. And and yeah, I would love to know more about that program okay. because it's very likely we could access uh, federal dollars to help set that up and provide that tuition, kind of like we do with our Strengthening Working Families Initiative that uh, is targeted at custodial parents um, and teaches in industrial trades, but it's free. We even provide wraparound services such as childcare, transportation, et cetera. And that was a $4 million US Department of uh, Labor grant that's been enabling us to do that. So. Um, I, you know, that, that idea, I, I, I love it. You know, I'm, I'm excited about it. So, um, I'm just looking to, for let me make sure I understand though. So EMT is different than EMS. Well, EMS, EMS is the system. EMS is the emergency management system. And EMT is an emergency management technician, emergency mm -hmm. medical technician, and a paramedic is a step way up much above an EMT. Okay. But much quite, quite often you have to have your EMT to be right. in the paramedic program. Yeah. This um, program does EMT and then firefighter awareness. So I think they tried to start building modules on top of EMT to get further certified. Which makes perfect that, sense. EMT so, is part of our firefighter program because yeah. firefighters will tell you 85% of their, their responses are medical. Mm -hmm. And so it's having that medical. And that's why part of why the fire services want to have paramedics too, who have that next extra level. So, and, and I will ask about the 39 versus 29. I know there's a reason we set it up for 39 credits. Um, yeah. And it probably, I know this program was driven heavily by the EMS providers around the state. In fact, we had paramedicine on the cut list at one point because the enrollment was so poor. And uh, I got an earful from our EMS friends about don't do that. And we didn't do that. And they've worked hard to um, hustle up the uh, enrollment but really, you know, a big thing that's made a difference is that scholarship. And that's one of the things I talked to Dan Batesy about, and we talked to you about, you know, is that if this is a priority, is there some way to have that scholarship continue? Um, the CRF funds were great, but boy, it was a scramble and a half trying to figure out how to fit the December 31st deadline uh, when it's a three semester program. Um, we punted because the department had some other money. It, it turned out the deadlines weren't extended, the department had other state funds, <clears throat> funds they squirreled away that they could cover the tuition. And now mercifully, the CRF deadlines are extended so we can use every nickel of their CRF funds uh, to cover all three semesters of, of scholarships. So um, it was a great thing, but it's, yeah, it's, it's not, that particular source of funding is not sustainable. I, I would just, um, in terms of setting up any kind of a new program, I would make sure that you work with um, Dan, I mean, with Pat Malone uh -huh. and um, Dan Batesy and Drew Hazelton, who's the yeah. chair of their education yeah. um, committee, because they, the state is working on new programs for 
EMTs, but they're also working on um, a new level <clears throat> called the first responders. And these really are very first responders. And when that, <clears throat> if, 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 according to what we've heard, I think, committee, is if we can get that first responder system set up, we can go a long way toward our workforce issue in the system. And then once people get that, then they, they have a, a sense of whether they wanna go on to become an EMT or not, because it's a, as we heard from Jim Baker this morning, it's a, there's a lot of trauma associated with in this field. And um, I have to tell you one of the most um, compelling testimonies we heard last year was from, um, um, oh, her name just went right out of my head. I can see her. Margaret, Margaret. Margaret Lagos. Lagos. Oh, yes, yep. Yes, as, as a volunteer. And, and so I, th I think that um, what we don't want to do, in my mind, is set up a lot of competing programs here that are competing with each other for dollars and for students. Yeah. So I would, I would suggest yeah. that any, looking at any new programs that you work with them. Oh, absolutely. Drew and Dan were part of the team we worked with a couple of years ago when we were considering possibly cutting our program. So yeah, and, okay. and I would just comment too. I mean, I think it was a couple of years ago, Senator, we were in the committee and I, I can't remember whether it was Drew or who it was who talked about, you know, like 50% of their paramedics do not renew their license after mm -hmm. the right. That's that, and then another 50% of those who stay off are gone a year later. I mean, you know, um, Jim Baker's testimony was compelling. And you think about what those people are dealing with no wonder, you know, I mean, the trauma is huge. And, and so, you know, the, the whole idea of the wellness commission makes a lot of sense. I mean, I have a brother-in-law, well, a friend, he's my sister-in-law's, my ex-sister-in-law's husband, who's an e who's a paramedic. And, you know, he tells those stories. I have a lot of healthcare providers in my family. Well, my ex-sister-in-law is a medical examiner here in Orange County. So, you know, they go to the worst of the worst. And, um, you feel for them. God bless that they do the work they're doing. So, those rescue people see <clears throat> our lives at our very worst. Yeah. yeah. The, the, Alice, Senator Clarkson. Um, I I think that uh, the other key thing with this, as we look at this system of training our emergency medical professionals, mm -hmm. is. Um, y y the ladder that the nurses have for, for their, uh, you know, encouraging, bringing people in at the beginning, mm -hmm. but, uh, just like we have this EMT training, uh, and, and then not viewing it as a disaster if they want to upskill and keep upskilling and upskilling. Uh, and to, because retention in the EMT and EMS system isn't just about the trauma, it's because they're paid so badly. Yeah. And, um, so, which is what we've heard repeatedly from Drew, how poor the pay is. Um, so for me, this is an, an yet another opportunity to actually also look at bringing in uh, our marginalized communities and our people, uh, you know, our BIPOC community and our new Americans into a system uh, where they get trained relatively uh, affordably, ho uh, hopefully, and then get into a system where they uh, are able to, 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 uh, get better, you know, more training, more training and upskilling and upskilling. And, and uh, it just, it seems to me that this is a, this is a, a win-win if we can get this right yeah. and make it affordable. Yeah. But we have to, we have to make sure that people are paid at the level yeah. because we, what we heard was that um, if you're a paramedic and you had that training, you can, you should just quit your job and go work for the hospital because you'll get paid more right. in the emergency room. So, so much better. And, and that doesn't require any more training. It isn't, the, it isn't a career ladder. You don't have, so other than asking what? people to go, it's like, anyway, we need yeah. to make sure that people are paid. 
Yeah, yes. I mean, our website, and admittedly, it's 2018 uh, data from Bureau of Labor Statistics, but median salary of a paramedic is $34,000, whereas the median salary of all occupations is $39,000. So, you know, it's, you're already starting, but so, and, you know, it's kind of like our veterinary technicians. I mean, they do it because they love it, but they don't make any money. And, you know, I think a lot of people go into this field because they're caregivers and they want to, but you, you can't make any decent money doing it. I mean, you know, it's, ha haven't we, it, has COVID taught us nothing else other than that our whole pay system in this country is backwards. <laughs> we pay the essential workers nothing and the athletes and actors gazillions. So, um, but I'll get off that soapbox quickly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> well, at least people are spending more time w watching Netflix than m maybe being at Walmart right now. <laughs> I mean, so it's like, really? <laughs> but you're right. <laughs> There's a pay disparity that's unbelievable. Yeah. Although we're probably paying the Netflix people a lot more than we're paying the people at Walmart and they're losing exactly. their jobs because exactly. they're, yeah. well, they're losing their jobs because no one is going there. So anyway. Well, uh, <coughs> online purchases. I know. No, no. <laughs> no <laughs> online purchases. If you can't purchase it in person right now, you probably don't need it. <laughs> you can wait till the stores reopen. Okay. Well, for those of us who live in Randolph, subject. and there's no such thing as at-home delivery, um, where do we go for groceries? <laughs> I mean, I, you I can go to the grocery store. store. I'm a yes. I'm a huge fan of of buying local, as you would imagine. Yes. Yeah. Yes, me too. But that's, I, I that's because my friend who can like go to the curbside pickup from Whole Foods or whatever. I'm like, wouldn't that be nice if you had curbside pickup, <laughs> right? Just curbside pickup it's <laughs> not there <laughs> you can, you can get a some yeah. curbside pickup from your local merchant is different than online purchases oh gosh yes yes you're at least buying online yeah you're and i find a lot of my local do that but the chains not so much like yeah, i, I know shaw's does cur curbside pickup or anyway. all right any more questions for so my deliveries back to you are, is the certification the same and have we looked at, a, at some sort of ladder approach, i.e. 29 and 39 credits? And yeah, I mean, and clearly as we, we seek to figure out this new delivery modality, Pat Malone will be one of the first people to talk to, so. Yeah, good. Yep. Any, any more comments or questions or concerns? I mean, this is an ongoing conversation and as I told Corey and I think hopefully the committee agrees that a lot of this doesn't need a legislative fix. Right. It just needs an ongoing conversation and make, and holding people's feet to the fire uh -huh. to, to make sure that things are happening, which is why we're having people come in here so that yeah. it's, it, it's a conversation that's alive and moving. Um, the only last thing I would say is, I mean, paramedicine, um, healthcare professions in general, I mean, the demographic challenge isn't helping us at all. So hence the point of trying to get at those students who don't pursue <clears throat> education post high school. But the other issue is, and I, you know, I know you're not the education committee, but students are less prepared coming out of high school than they used to be. It's just plain and simple. The math and the science and the writing isn't the same. Um, and it's only gotten worse in COVID, as I'm sure you know. So, you know, that's the other challenge is some of these programs are hard. You know, it's it's hard work to become a nurse. It's hard work to become mm -hmm. a paramedic. And, uh, but, you know, we, I'm grateful we fill up our, our nursing program mostly um, every year. There's a couple of Brattleboro, Bennington are always, Bennington in particular, a challenge to, uh, to fill up. But I hear continually from faculty, they're just not the same level of students. Mm -hmm. so, um, it's, you know, I... I, it's, it's an old conversation, I know, but it isn't getting any better, so. But that's discouraging. Yeah. That's so I just want to make one comment about the kind of the ladder for um, healthcare people. So AHEC runs um, a number of programs, um, MedQuest Camp and different things. And one of the things that they used to do, and I think they don't do it anymore, but I'm not sure, is they had a program for um, like seventh and eighth graders uh -huh. to, to just kind of 
feel out the medical field and see if they might be interested. And they called it blood and guts. <laughs> and the boys loved it. They all, seventh and eighth grade boys, signed up for it right away. <laughs> and some of them, some of them um, ended up thinking that was a good profession to go into. But AHEC does a great job on healthcare education, educating students about opportunities in healthcare, and it's yeah. it's huge. So yeah. great. But blood and guts, yeah, that's <laughs> blood and guts. Speaking of Netflix, right? <laughs> <laughs> so. I appreciate thank you. your time and I will get back to you and thank you very much and y'all stay warm this weekend. And you the next too, time we Pat. have this conversation, I think we'll try to make sure that we have Pat and Drew and people here so we can kind of have a more round table discussion. Yeah, and next time I'll get Inga to join us as well. Okay, so, great. Great. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Pat. Bye-bye. Nice <laughs> to see you. So committee, did you, you got the list for... Tuesday, does that make sense to break it down that way? Did anybody have a chance to look at it, Brian? I was just wondering whether we could take a five minute break. Oh yes, let's. And then I don't think that this will, this conversation will go very long, but I would like to have oh. it. So, okay. so no, let's take a five minute break though. Cause yeah. I for one would be very happy. <laughs> so, and what are you wanting us to work off of your email? Well, I'm wanting to, I'm wanting to see if the way I tentatively organize the elections conversation makes sense. I kind of divided it into checklist, ballots, town clerks for right. the first time. Does, right. does, every, does everybody have the list? And then I yep. put the things under there that I thought made sense. And obviously they could go in many different categories but the email titled elections issues right uh, yeah from two hours ago yeah yes. yep. so the first one is the checklist itself and that's the idea of purging having one statewide checklist which and i'm putting all the ideas on here that people said somebody suggested not having the town clerks do the checklist which i don't think will go anywhere <clears throat> and then um, purging, and I'm not sure how much we have to say about that, but I don't think that whole conversation will take a long time, because if there are, the Secretary of State will be able to tell us what we are legally allowed to do to purge the checklist, because a lot of it is under the Federal Voters' Rights Act. <clears throat> and then under ballots, I um, put the things on there that we talked about that were pretty, seemed pretty um, self-explanatory. The, um, the ones that you see that seem new here are mainly ones that came from um, Deb Bilodeau from the Republican Party, like guaranteed paper ballot. And I think that we already do in statute, but I put it on here because it was a, a, on the list and um, put all of these under here. And I'm looking to see what she meant clearly by the um, issue of mail ballots mailed to nursing homes. So I'll have more clarity on what she meant there. And then, um, so that, that has to do with ballots itself. And then um, town clerks, there's a lot of a lot of ideas under there. And um, again, the ones that you had not seen before were um, <coughs> um, limit the early processing to one day, to the day before. Um, and <coughs> report the totals, uh, total votes, votes cast at the close of the polls. And voter ID required and authorize multi-party observers and same-day voters get um, a provisional ballot instead of the regular ballot. Those all came from um, the Republican Party. <clears throat> and they're on here because they were, we asked for those. <clears throat> so then, so that's day one. Do you think that's? That's a lot in day one, yeah. <laughs> it is, funny. and we may not get through all of them, but. Yeah. 
<laughs> and then day two, we put candidates, um, primaries, general election, and miscellaneous. And um, Keisha, your thing is under candidates. Yeah, I'm happy to rename it to like defining residency. I, I had put out an idea that seemed to be different than what, what you had put out was problematic in your um, in your like letter that you didn't mean to have be a letter. But I mean, a lot of what I've heard back, people have said, what, you know, a lot of people have given me feedback since they heard it was a topic yesterday. And it's been either get rid of the requirement or make it 183 days each year that they live here. But I don't know, you know, I, I, I'm happy to stick with just the idea that I, I have that I think is actually the least expensive and allows you to be abroad and still demonstrate you care about Vermont. But um, well, well, I will take we'll we'll take that up. I, I have I don't want to get us into the 10 hours of conversation that we had around this issue before. Right. Um, and it, it was probably 10 hours. Mm -hmm. and I was struck by the Secretary of State's office saying they, they still get questions and don't feel like they can answer them because that makes young people, they can't. it feels hard, you know, to know someone's, I mean, when I first ran, people were like, well, do you know if you meet the residency requirement? And it, it felt very somewhat xenophobic, ageist, you know, all kinds of things that, that I think we should have a standard definition. So, so that's why I raised it. You know, a lot of us have had an experience where someone questioned our residency because we're brown or young or, you know. Oh, 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 oh. But well, they was, questioned it for Molly Gray too. So it isn't. Yeah, it was a question it, for it a lot of candidates, not just yeah. five of them. So I just feel like it's, you know, it's, I'm, I'm sorry, I wasn't here for all that testimony, <laughs> but it just feels like I was trying to build on what I saw you had already learned. We yeah. could, we could try to have the conversation, but I really, and everybody has a definition that they would like to see. 181 mm -hmm. days, that's half, half a year. Right. Does that mean that if you, um, your car broke down when you were on your way home from Florida for the winter and so you were only here 179 days, you're not eligible? Or I, I, I really, really think that the only way, that the courts are the only way that this is going to be resolved because we can't get rid of the requirement mm -hmm. of the residency because that's right. in the Constitution. Right. Or we could have a constitutional amendment, but not this year. Yeah. So well, we can't. I, I, I think given the robustness of the conversations, both the one that's that stimulated our long conversation and the latest ones, it's at, we're at least worth seeing if there's been any new thinking from the Secretary of State's office on this or from anybody else. I it's it just keeps cropping up. So it's something I think we should address. Okay, well, and we will have the AG's office here because I, I really suspect that they will find almost anything that we do could be considered unconstitutional. But, okay. I, I mean, I, I, I hate to be so negative yeah. about this, but I do remember the conversations before and they, they were so long and protracted that when I bought my um, state house book, you know, that really beautiful book, um, the what's her first name graph did the um the writing in it yes chris's uh wife yes chris graph's wife she they all signed it for me and she did not sign her name she signed it garrett's mom yeah that's yeah. because so yeah. i hate i hate to because i know this conversation is going to be hours and hours long that's that's helpful context. I you know I didn't know I had gotten that emotional. Honestly, you know, um, it, it, well, it it is because it how um, can you force people to vote? Can you say 183 is the right number of days? Can you say that you had to have been here physically present all the time when when Brian goes to Florida and signs in is he right a resident or isn't he i mean do you have a historian speak to the original intent when they put in residency or well they don't i mean we don't have anybody really that know. was around when they put it in 
Right. <laughs> I just didn't know if there was, you know, people who, who went back and tried to study the intent of the framing of our Vermont Constitution. Well, but we did Peter hear from Peter, may have done that. Okay. We did Peter hear from Teach Peter yeah. Teachout and yeah, Paul Gillies and, um, yeah. and Giuliani, who are the three people that we usually, and okay. Betsy Ann Rask, who are the people that we usually ask for constitutional um, opinions. So, but we will, we will have it. I just want to, I'm going to um, keep it very brief. Right. Because we, otherwise we will have everybody from across the state um, weighing in with um, a different idea for a residency requirement. And that's the only one. Yeah. You have to be a resident. So I appreciate you letting a little bit more conversation happen about it. You know, for so, um, that's what, so candidates, and then I put on there also the um, <clears throat> miscellaneous or the corporate contributions and the public financing and translation services mm -hmm. under miscellaneous. Okay. I, so I, will, I just heard from BPIRG today that they are already asking places like Burlington and the Secretary of State's office if they're translating ballot information for a town meeting day, if they're gonna have that interpretive and um, ballots in other languages and things like that. So we might okay, well, we'll have that conversation. In there. And then day three is the permanent mail out question. Does that make sense? Yeah. Sure. Okay, great. I, right. you, I think you organized it really well. You, you, it was a, it, I, I think you did well, Jeanette. Thank you. Well, I just, um, I don't want people coming in and talking about nicknames and then um, in the same uh, conversation talking about why we should permanently mail out ballots because it just gets too, too cumbersome. So, okay. okay. Great. Anything okay. else? Um, my are, you, are we going to go off the record at the moment? Yes. Thank you.